My name is Andy Hamilton. I'm originally from Northern Ireland, uh, although I have lived most of my life in Italy. I'm 37 years old and I've lived 27, 28 years in Italy. So Italian is my, my first language, uh, but as you can tell, I have retained somewhat of a Northern Irish accent as well. Uh, so you have two options this afternoon. I can either speak Northern Irish or I can speak Italian. And it's not obvious to me which one would be easier for you to, uh, to understand. Um, I have the privilege of uh, teaching Old Testament in Rome at the Bible College. Uh, I teach at the Bible College called eBay, which is not the online auction website. It's uh, Istituto Biblico Evangelico Italiano. That's the Italian Evangelical Biblical Institute. And uh, I'm delighted that you're here this afternoon. And really my purpose for our time together is simply to motivate you to preach the Old Testament prophets. Uh, I hope I will be able to motivate you uh, to see the value of preaching this part of scripture. And I also hope to give you some advice and some tips along the way that may be uh, helpful. Uh, so let's consider, first of all, the reasons why we should preach the Old Testament prophets. Why dedicate time, precious time, precious pulpit minutes to preaching the Old Testament prophets? Well, I think the first and the most basic reason is that our role as pastors, as preachers, as Bible teachers is to preach the whole counsel of God. You'll remember when Paul was ending his time in Ephesus, he was able to declare himself innocent of the blood of the believers in Ephesus because he had taught, he had preached the entire, the whole counsel of God. And so I think the most obvious reason why we must preach the Old Testament prophets is because a significant proportion of the Old Testament is dedicated to the Old Testament prophets. If we consider the corpus of prophetic literature from Isaiah to Malachi, that is similar in size to the entire New Testament. So this is not a marginal part of scripture. This is a significant chunk of of the word of God for his people. And therefore we cannot afford to neglect this part of scripture. And if we do neglect this part of scripture, then we will find that the church will be impoverished because they are not benefiting from the blessings that come from the Old Testament prophets. I will not reveal any names, but over the last couple of years, I have done a little bit of research uh, looking especially at the, the most um, the famous evangelical preachers that are committed to expository preaching. And I have analyzed where they're spending most of their time. And as you can guess, they're spending most of their time in the epistles of the New Testament, then some time in the Gospels, then a little bit of time in the Old Testament narratives, and then sometimes in the Psalms, especially in the summer, seems to be summer Psalms, seem to be a feature for many, for many preachers. Uh, and yet very little time is dedicated to the Old Testament prophets. The majority of the Old Testament prophets have not been touched in pulpits where you've had one pastor for over 20 years in the same pulpit and they have only sporadically touched on some passages from the Old Testament. Typically on the lead up to Christmas, where you have a few prophecies that predict the arrival of the Lord Jesus, and that's, that's where the attention to the prophets is restricted. And again, I'm not speaking about liberals, I'm speaking about evangelicals who are committed to expository preaching and who have been in the same pulpit for over 20 years. We're very familiar with the slogan sola scriptura, which of course comes from the reformers. But alongside this slogan, they also had the slogan tota scriptura, which was the other side of the coin. Their commitment was to uphold scripture as the ultimate authority, but to uphold the entirety of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And if we consider the practice of the reformers, uh, 
This was not just a commitment on their doctrinal statement. If we follow and, and trace Calvin, for example, it's well known that Calvin essentially preached through all of the books of the Bible apart from Revelation. And so there was, there was this commitment to preach the entirety of Scripture. So the most fundamental reason why we must preach the Old Testament prophets is because of the sheer size, the sheer quantity of material that comes to us through the prophetic literature. But beyond that, let me suggest three other reasons why we must not neglect the Old Testament prophets. The first reason is that we must learn from the example of Jesus and the New Testament writers. And we will see that Jesus and the New Testament writers dependent on the Old Testament prophets much more than we realize. Then a second reason for preaching the prophets is because the value of their message. They have a unique contribution to give, a unique contribution to scripture, and we must recognize the value of their message. And then a third reason for us as preachers to want to preach the Old Testament prophets is that we can learn a lot from the prophets. The prophets were masterful communicators. And when you spend time with the prophets, you're able to obtain and to borrow some of their communication techniques that we can use as well today. So let's consider each one of these reasons. The first reason why we should preach the Old Testament prophets is because the prophets disclose the identity of Jesus. There's been a strong push over the last number of decades to connecting the Old Testament to Christ. Um, we were thinking about Tim Keller over the last few mornings and one of his major contributions has been to connect the Old Testament to Christ. Cindy Gridanus has been another strong advocate of this approach of connecting the entirety of Scripture to its centerpiece, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Gridanus suggests that interpreters will miss the heart of prophecy when they fail to link it to Jesus Christ. So if we are not connecting the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or one of the minor prophets to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are missing we are failing to understand the heart of the prophecy. Whilst I agree with this approach that Gridanus and others are uh, suggesting, I think we can also invert it. I think it's also possible to state that interpreters will miss the heart of the identity and the mission of Jesus Christ if we fail to link him to the prophets. So in a sense, the relationship between the Old Testament and Christ is bi-directional. Not just must we connect the prophets to Christ, but we also must realize how Christ depended on the Old Testament to reveal his identity. And in order to see this, we simply just need to consider the primary titles that are used in the New Testament for the Lord Jesus. He is presented as the Messiah. And in order to understand Jesus Christ, Christ is Messiah, in order to understand that, we must understand that this is a title that comes to us from the Old Testament. It's a title which was fostered and was shaped in the Old Testament prophets. If we consider another title of the Lord Jesus, his favorite title for himself, uh, we have spent some time in the Bible Preachers and Teachers Network this week considering the Gospel of Mark. And we noted how the favorite title that Jesus used for himself was the title Son of Man. In the Gospel of Mark, he's keen to keep a secret on his messianic identity. He is introducing himself as the Son of Man. Yet this title is not original of the Lord Jesus. He is borrowing this title from the context of the Old Testament prophets. Of course, it's the prophet Ezekiel who is often referred to as the Son of Man. 
And there is a sense in which the title in the book of Ezekiel is revealing Ezekiel's humanity, his, his frailty, his weakness. And so Jesus is using this title, Son of Man, to represent his humanity. But you will also remember that the title Son of Man is used in that spectacular vision in Daniel chapter 7. You remember the various beasts in Daniel chapter 7 that represent the various kingdoms. And then you have the Ancient of Days who hands over the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, to the figure of the Son of Man. And so when Jesus is using this title, the Son of Man, he wants us to connect it with this vision that comes from Daniel chapter 7. At the very end of his life, when Jesus was on trial, the high priest said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus answers, I am. I am the Son of Man who comes riding on the clouds. And Jesus is using this title, all of the baggage of this title, to reveal his divinity. And what was the reaction of the high priest? He tore his garments and he accused Jesus of blasphemy. He understood what Jesus was doing by using the title Son of Man. And then another title that we, fa- we see used of Jesus in the Gospels is the title Servant of the Lord. This concept that the Messiah is also the suffering servant. This was such a difficult uh, aspect for Peter to understand. How can the Messiah be the suffering servant? And again, the identity of the suffering servant is revealed to us in the Old Testament prophets, and in particular in the four servant songs that we find in the book of Isaiah. So you see that in order to simply understand the identity of Jesus, the titles that Jesus used of himself and that the Gospels used to present the Lord Jesus, we must know, we must be familiar with the Old Testament prophets. Jesus as the Messiah, as the servant of the Lord, as the Son of Man, all relate back to the Old Testament prophets. But it's actually not just the identity of Jesus, it's also the teaching of Jesus that is shaped by the Old Testament prophets. If you think of some of the most famous sayings of the Lord Jesus, they are not original, they actually come from the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets hold the copyright in some of the most famous sayings of Jesus. When Jesus speaks about the spring of living water. This is an expression which is nested in the Old Testament prophets that Jesus is using. When Jesus speaks about the vine and the vineyard, this again is language that is coming from the Old Testament prophets. When Jesus is using the expression to be born again and the conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus, The background to this language comes from Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37. And you even see that Jesus is frustrated with Nicodemus. He says to Nicodemus, you're the teacher in Israel and you do not know these things. You don't know, you haven't read the book of Ezekiel. That's what he's saying to Nicodemus. Or if you think of the use of the fig tree, especially in the Gospel of Mark, this comes from the prophets. Or even the expression, I will make you fishers of men. This is not original of Jesus. This is borrowed from the prophet Jeremiah. Or the language of bride and groom. This is one of the major themes of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, Isaiah uses this theme. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, of course, uses this, this theme. And when Jesus is introducing himself as the bridegroom, He is referring back to the Old Testament prophets. Again, the expression light of the world, hear but never understand from Isaiah chapter 6. The cup of God's wrath, again, language that comes from the prophets. The den of robbers, you have made the house of the father, the house of prayer, a den of robbers. Again, comes from the prophet Jeremiah. The language of the harvest, 
the language of the sheep and shepherd, and many of other expressions and teachings and sayings of the Lord Jesus come from the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus expects his followers, his disciples, to catch these allusions to the Old Testament. Now, sometimes Jesus is using this language in continuity with the Old Testament. Sometimes he is offering a new perspective on something that the prophets have said. But in order to fully understand the teaching of the Lord Jesus, we must be, have a basic knowledge of the Old Testament prophets. But it wasn't just Jesus who relied on the teaching of the prophets. We see the same also for other New Testament writers. In the book of Acts, we often see that the apostles are quoting from the Old Testament prophets to demonstrate that the Messiah must suffer, to demonstrate that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer, they rely on the prophets. Or you remember another critical moment in the book of Acts at the council and the conference in Jerusalem. And how is that conference actually solved? Well, it's actually solved when James is quoting from the book of Amos in the Old Testament. And that's what unpacks and resolves the tension that was taking place between Jews and Gentiles. Or if you think of the Apostle Paul and in his epistles, how often does he quote from the Old Testament prophets? Even the most famous soteriological expression of Paul, that the righteous shall live by faith, that Paul quotes in Romans, it's quoted again in Galatians, it's quoted again in Hebrews. Where does this expression come from? It comes from Habakkuk, from the Old Testament prophet. Or you have Peter, who is advising us and saying to us that the prophetic word is more sure, is more secure than even, even his own experience of the transfiguration. And you'll remember that Peter tells us that the prophets were not serving themselves, but were serving us. Okay, so the prophets brought about a revelation that was for us as people of the new covenant. And then if we think of John in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation doesn't have any direct quotation from the Old Testament, but every verse is permeated and saturated with allusions from the Old Testament prophets. So you see that focusing and paying attention to the Old Testament prophets, it's important not just because we understand their message, but by knowing and understanding their message, we're better positioned to understand the message of Jesus and the New Testament writers. I often say to my students in Rome that if they don't know the Old Testament, they have two problems. One, they don't know the Old Testament. And two, they are unable to understand fully the New Testament because the New Testament writers expect that we catch references to the Old Testament. So if the prophets were important for Jesus and for the New Testament writers, I suggest that the prophets should be important for us too. A second reason why we should spend time in the Old Testament prophets is because of the value of their message. They have a unique contribution to the God's revelation, to God's word for his people. And of course, it's impossible to summarize completely the teaching of the Old Testament prophets. But I think the heart of the covenant is, described, is, is, is well placed to describe the message of the prophets. The heart of the covenant is that the Lord says, I will be their God and they will be my people. And the prophets offer a unique vision of God especially of the greatness of God, and at the same time, they offer a very sobering and realistic view of ourselves, of our own heart and our own corruption. The prophets are not just there to denounce our sinfulness, but the prophets help you to feel the horror of your sin, 
They say that we are corrupt from head to toe. They say that our hearts are deceitful, that our sinfulness is perpetual. They say that our good deeds are worthless before a holy God. And if there is a need today to have a renewed appreciation of the gravity and the seriousness of sin, perhaps there is no better place to go to than the Old Testament prophets. They were confronting a rebellious nation and they have many ways in which they're able to get under your skin and to, to disturb you with the seriousness of your rebellion to God. They spoke about idolatry. They spoke about injustice. They spoke about religious formality. And these are sins that continue to plague the people of God today. And so as Chris Wright has rightly said, the church today, and not just society, needs to be confronted with the horror of idolatry, of injustice, of compromise. But as well as revealing our sinfulness, the prophets also reveal the greatness of God. And as you journey through the Old Testament prophets, you get to admire the great God of Scripture. You see the all-powerful creator. You see and are confronted with the Holy One of Israel. This is one of the favorite titles of Isaiah that he uses throughout his book. You see that the Lord is described as a passionate husband who is willing to chase after his unfaithful bride, who is relentless in his pursuit of his unfaithful bride. We see that the Lord is presented as a forgiving, forgiving father, as the supreme sovereign, a caring shepherd, righteous judge, gracious savior. And these are just some of the characteristics of the Lord that are presented in the prophets. So if we want our people to have a, a renewed vision of the greatness of God, it's worth spending time in the prophets. And then the third reason that I would suggest that it's worthwhile spending time with the prophets is that spending time with the prophets, it's like attending an advanced homiletics class. Uh, the prophets were more than preachers, but they have many features that are similar to us as preachers. And if you consider the three primary elements of rhetoric, ethos, logos, and pathos, and if you, you use these three elements to consider the prophets, you will see that the prophets were a remarkable bunch. In terms of their ethos, in terms of their integrity in being committed to God, they are an example of faithfulness. Think about the prophet Jeremiah. Think about the many struggles and battles that he had with the false prophets. The false prophets that were announcing that everything was going well, that it was a time of peace, a time of shalom. And then you had Jeremiah who was exposing the sinfulness of the people. And because of that, Jeremiah suffered. He was thrown into prison. He actually tried to resign on a number of occasions. But you see Jeremiah's integrity from the beginning to the end, his commitment to proclaiming the word of God. And beyond anything in terms of methodology, as preachers today, we need to regain that credibility and that commitment to God's word and that commitment to the cause of the gospel. But also if you consider the logos, the message of the prophets, the prophets were <coughs> crystal clear in delivering their message. Clarity was their forte. There was no ambiguity in the message of the prophets. The people knew exactly what the prophets were saying. It was only that the, the prophets were, uh, that the people were not willing to respond and to obey the message of the prophets. And then if you think of their pathos, the prophets were passionate 
communicators. They, their message became part of themselves. If you think even of a prophet Ezekiel at the very beginning, how he devours the message that he is then to speak and his own life becomes part of the message that he is communicating. We'll return to this later on and we'll see how we can learn from the genius of the rhetoric of the prophets. Now, before I consider some practical tips in order to preach the prophets well, let me first of all mention three potential traps that we may encounter. The first trap that we may encounter is what I have called the historical trap. If you have spent any time in the Old Testament prophets, you will understand that in order to understand and to proclaim their message, you must have a good grasp of Old Testament history. You need to be aware that the kingdom of Israel divided in two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You need to be aware that you have Israel in the north, you have Judah in the south. You need to be aware that you, the Davidic line continues in Judah and not in Israel in the north. You need to be aware that Samaria, Samaria is the capital of Israel, Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. And you need to be aware as well of the superpowers that are surrounding the nation of Israel and Judah. You need to be aware of the Assyrians who come in 722 and deport the northern kingdom away in exile. You need to be aware of the Babylonians who then come and deport the people of Judah into captivity for 70 years. You need to be aware that after that you have the Persians who allowed for the people of Judah to return to the promised land. And in order to preach the Old Testament prophets, you need to do your homework. You need to have a good grasp of Old Testament history. And the better you understand the historical context, the better you will understand the message. But why do I say that it's a trap? Well, one of the reasons why it's a trap is because it's easy to get lost in history. As preachers, we must, and teachers of the Word of God, we must do our homework. We must have a good knowledge of Old Testament history. But when we enter the pulpit, we are then in great danger of giving a history lesson. And sometimes I've heard sermons on the Old Testament prophets, and 50% of the sermon is a history lesson. Now again, you need to have a basic understanding of the history that has taken place in order to understand the message. But we must make sure that we are preaching the text, not the events behind the text. Okay? Our purpose is not simply to tell what took place. Our purpose is to preach the Word of God. We preach the passage. We preach the text. The background to the text helps us to understand the text. But we must preach the biblical passage and not the events behind it. And so the general rule when you're preaching the Old Testament prophets is give enough information in order to understand the passage. Hopefully you will have a much better understanding. You have spent hours researching and studying, but in the pulpit just give the essential information, the minimal information that is necessary in order to understand the passage. To say it in one sentence, we need to master the history, but we preach the text. We are masters of the history, but we preach the word of God. A second trap that we may encounter when we're preaching the Old Testament prophets is what I have called the eschatological trap. Now, I'm not sure what it's like in your own context, but in my own context in Italy, in the 80s and 90s especially, there was a fascination with eschatology, with end times. And as a result of that, very, the few times that people preach from the Old Testament prophets, they usually preach from the Old Testament prophets to support 
their own eschatological view. And so rather than preaching the message of the prophets, what you actually have is sterile presentations of an eschatological position. Now, it's true that in the Old Testament prophets, we have some predictions relating to the future. But it's wrong for us to fall into the equation where prophecy means prediction. It's actually a small percentage of the prophetic message that is actually predictive. Prophecy was the word of God for the people of God. And 90% of the prophetic message was relevant to the generation that the prophets served. Fee and Stuart, in their book, um, How to Read Scripture for All It's Worth, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, they estimate that less than 2% of Old Testament prophecy is messianic. Less than 5% describes the New Covenant age. And less than 1% describes events yet to come in our time. Now, it's hard to evaluate these percentages. Uh, it depends, of course, on your eschatological position. Uh, but I think this is helpful for us to realize that the majority of the prophetic message is not catapulted in the future. The majority of the prophetic message was for the people of God at that time and continues to be for us today not because it's revealing the future but because it's revealing God it's revealing our sinfulness it's revealing what it means to be the covenant people of God and in order to avoid this eschatological trap let me offer three questions that I think are helpful to tackle when we are approaching some of the predictive elements of the Old Testament prophecy. The first question that I would ask is, to what degree, if any, is the prophecy closed in figurative language? When you pay attention to the Old Testament uh, language of the prophets, you'll understand the language goes from a very literal, prosaic language to poetry. And if we were to place the Old Testament prophets on this spectrum, the Old Testament prophets use primarily use poetical language. And so our default approach when we are interpreting the prophets is that we must understand that they are using figurative language. That does not mean that they're not speaking about real events that will take place in history. It simply means that they are describing these real events using figurative language. For example, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4 says that they will transform their spears into pruning hooks. Okay, And this is actually a, a, something that we will find again in Micah and in other prophets. They will get their spears and they will transform them into pruning hooks, which is used for agriculture. What is the prophet revealing? Is he literally describing a time when someone will take his sword or take his spear and transform it into a pruning hook? Or is he using a figure of speech to describe a time of peace, a time when you will no longer need resources for military, but you can use those resources for internal agricultural domestic use. And again, notice that what's in question here is not the historicity of the event, but it's the manner in which the prophet is describing the event. Is he using literal language to describe the real event, or is he using figurative language to describe the real event? And in some situations, you'll find that the prophet is using literal language. In other situations, you'll find that he's using figurative language. And in other situations, you'll find middle of the road language. Remember the vision in Isaiah chapter 11, where we have it described that the wolf will dwell with the lamb. You've maybe even seen the poster, the wolf and the lamb here, there together. Is that literal 
language. One day will lose animals, be lying side by side. Or is it describing and offering a concrete picture of shalom, of peace, of harmony, where the, the consequences of the fall have been restored? And so, again, I don't want to give you answers. I just want to give you the questions. Uh, so consider how much of the prophetic language is figurative language. The second question that we must tackle is to what degree, if any, is the prophecy subject to conditions? Often we have this default approach where the negative prophecies, the prophecies of judgment, we consider them to be conditional. And then the prophecies of salvation, of restoration, we consider them to be unconditional. Um, but of course, if we're reading carefully the prophetic message within the context of the old covenant, then we must take seriously in the consideration how much of the message is conditional. You'll remember when the Lord took Jeremiah on a field trip to the potter's house and he sees the potter who is working with clay. I think it's Jeremiah chapter 18. And he says to Jeremiah, look, I, I am the potter. And if I have said I will bless a nation, but then they disobey me, then that blessing is no longer valid, but they will be judged. On the other hand, if I have spoken words of judgment to a nation, and then they repent and come back to me and obey my word, then the judgment will be transformed into blessing. And so often behind the prophetic message, there are conditions. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings curses, chastisement, and discipline on the part of the Lord. And sometimes the conditions are not explicit, but are implicit. The best example is probably Jonah. Remember Jonah, the reluctant prophet who goes to Nineveh. And then what's his message? Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. No conditions. It's, it's simply a fact. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. But the people understand that there's a condition behind it. And the people repent. And because of that, the Lord holds back his judgment. And even Jonah is aware of that. And that's why he complains to God. He said, I knew that your chesed, your love is so abundant that you will relinquish from your judgment. Or to apply it to what we're considering in these days, uh, the book of Malachi, the people expected it to be a time of exuberant blessing. Why? Because the prophets spoke about this future time where the people would be gathered again from all the nations, they would return again, there would be a new glorious temple, a new glorious time for the nation of Israel, and then they return, and it's all quite disappointing. Why is that? Well, perhaps one of the issues is that these are conditional prophecies, and because there was a half-heartedness in the people's return to the Lord, then the blessings that they are enjoying are half-hearted. Again, I just want to offer questions and then let you ponder them. The third question that I would advise that you would ask is, to what degree, if any, has the prophecy been fulfilled? And as we trace the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets, prophecies, we see that prophecies can be fulfilled in many different ways. Sometimes you have an, an immediate, most of the time you would have an immediate fulfillment to the prophetic word. Then sometimes you have a distant fulfillment. For example, a prophecy that relates to the first coming of the Lord Jesus or the second coming of the Lord Jesus. In other situations, you would have a progressive fulfillment. You remember the illustration of the mountaintops, you know, where the prophets, from their point of view, they see events which are distance between them of a long time. They see them as together. And so sometimes you have the prophecy which is relating to something in the context of the prophet, something in the first coming of Jesus, 
and something in the second coming of Jesus. Remember Jesus who in the synagogue is reading from Isaiah and he interrupts the passage from Isaiah because it's the, it's the, the year of grace but not yet the day of judgment. And so the prophets sometimes bring together events which are distant uh, between them. Or else you have, and it's quite common that you would have typological uh, fulfillment, where you have uh, an immediate fulfillment to the prophecy, and this immediate fulfillment then guarantees that there will be the ultimate fulfillment in the future. So in order to avoid falling into the eschatological trap, it's better not to superimpose our eschatological view on the Old Testament prophets, but allow for the prophets to reveal their message. And if we ask these questions, we ask questions to get answers. So we ask these questions and we, permit, we allow the prophets to shape the answer. The third trap that I would warn against is what I would call the character trap. As I said, I've heard very few preachers preach from the Old Testament prophets, but the preachers who do preach from the Old Testament prophets often are fascinated with the personality and the experience of the prophets. And I think that's unbalanced because we actually have very limited biographical information about the prophets. And even the very little information that we do have is not to draw attention to the prophet himself, but is contributing to his message. Think, for example, of the information that we have regarding the wives of the prophets. Okay? So think of prophet Isaiah. We know we have some information in chapter 7, chapter 8 about his wife. And his wife actually gives birth to a son. You remember the name of the, the, the son, uh, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, which really was an announcement that the Assyrians were about to invade Israel. And so the purpose of giving that biographical information is not for us to know that Isaiah was married or that he had two sons. The purpose is contributing to the message of the prophet. Or Jeremiah. What do we know about Jeremiah's wife? We don't have any information about Jeremiah's wife because the Lord prohibited Jeremiah from marrying because they were just before the time of captivity. So it was a time of repentance, not a time for celebration. And therefore the Lord tells Jeremiah not to marry. And so again, you see how this biographical information is contributing to the message. Or you remember that Jeremiah buys a land. Do you remember that? As the Babylonians are ready to invade Jerusalem, he buys a plot of land. Why would you do such a thing? This was a guarantee that the Lord would, after captivity, after the 70 years, he would bring his people back. Or Ezekiel. Do you remember any information about Ezekiel's wife? tragic Ezekiel's wife dies and Ezekiel is not even allowed to mourn his wife because this represents the Lord's suffering as he sees the destruction of Jerusalem and then of course the prophet Hosea but you see how the biographical information is not to fulfill our curiosity but it's actually to further and to contribute to the message of the prophets and so the Old Testament scholar Seilhammer, he says that the prophets speak to us not just as the authors, but also as characters within the framework of those books. And we need to understand that to understand the Old Testament prophets. So the three traps to avoid, the uh, historical trap, the eschatological trap, and the character trap. Let's consider now four tips for how to preach the prophets. My first suggestion is the most basic suggestion, is that in order to understand and to preach the Old Testament prophets, 
we must understand the prophetic genre. We must understand how the literature actually functions. As expository preachers, we want to preach both the content and we want to replicate the form of the biblical genres. And so we must understand something about the prophetic genre. Now that's quite difficult for us because we don't have the equivalent today. We have the equivalent of biblical narratives. We have the equivalent of the Psalms. We have the equivalent of uh, the epistles, but we don't really have the equivalent to the prophetic genre. So let me just highlight three or four features of the prophetic genre. The first characteristic is that the prophetic books are best understood as divinely inspired anthologies. They are collections of the oracles of the prophets. And these collections, these anthologies, are not usually organized chronologically, but thematically. So if we consider the three major prophets, we're able to identify the themes that we find in the various sections of their books. So the books start off with oracles of judgment uh, against Israel and Judah. Then we have oracles of judgment for the nations. And then we have oracles of salvation. And if you trace, for example, the prophet Jeremiah, you will see that these are not given in chronological order. They are organized thematically. I suppose a good um, equivalent for us today would be a collection of sermons. Okay, imagine a collection of sermons of a famous preacher and you're organizing the sermons which have been delivered across his lifetime. You're organizing these sermons thematically. So you have sermons on the sovereignty of God, you have uh, sermons on salvation, you have ser sermons on church discipline, and you're organizing the sermons thematically. That's what's taken place in the Old Testament prophets. But of course, they're not just organized. They are organized uh, by the Lord himself who inspired these books. And so what you have here is inspired crafting the Lord intentionally bringing together oracles that treat similar themes in order to amplify the message of the prophets. One of the characteristics that you will notice in the prophetic books is that they appear to be extremely repetitive. I think that's one of the difficulties that we have with the prophetic books because we're reading oracle of judgment after oracle of judgment after oracle of judgment or oracle of salvation after oracle of salvation and it becomes we have this feeling that it becomes redundant but actually that's part of the strategy of the prophets where they are grouping together the same message delivered in different moments in different ways to have this amplification effect it's called the recursive effect. It's the intensification effect of bringing together all these oracles that treat similar themes. And so when we're preaching the Old Testament prophets, we want to pay attention to the compositional strategy that was used. Understand why the book was organized. And good commentaries or good study Bibles are usually able to help you identify the major blocks of the prophetic books. The second aspect that we want to highlight of the prophetic genre is that they are a collection of oracles. Here we have oral communication that is then recorded in written form. So we can imagine Jeremiah, we can imagine Amos, we can imagine Isaiah who are preaching, who are delivering these oracles in city centers, in Jerusalem, in the square in Jerusalem. And the role of the prophet was to, uh, they were called by God to call the people of God back to God. And the Old Testament, the Hebrew term for prophet is the term Navi. And the term Navi actually holds this connotation of someone who is called to, 
to call people back to God. And so that is their purpose. And now this has a benefit for us as preachers because their oracles are well suited for oral communication because they were initially delivered orally. So in a sense, we have oral communication that has now been recorded in written form and it's now our task to communicate this in, in an oral form. Uh, we have this expression that we find over 300 times in the prophetic books, thus says the Lord. And so we have this direct speech of the Lord through the prophets. The third characteristic of the prophetic genre is that they spoke um, using poetical language. And you will know that the primary characteristic of Old Testament poetry is parallelism. And so as you open up the prophets, you will notice how the prophets are using parallelism to uh, uh, deliver their message. And of course, that's one of the marks of good oral communication. Uh, when you're reading or you're writing, you can say something once because someone can then go back and read what you've written. When you're communicating orally, you need to repeat, you need to restate the same concept because that helps people grasp the message. And the prophets use parallelism throughout. And then they use figures of speech. They are brilliant in using met metaphors, hyperbole, irony, a whole series, a full arsenal of figures of speech we find in the Old Testament prophets. And then the final characteristic of the Old Testament prophetic literature is that it's visionary literature. And what I mean by visionary literature is that the, the role of the prophets was to offer a different perspective on reality. Now, we often think of Isaiah chapter 6 as the visionary element of the book of Isaiah. But if you read Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1, the entire book is presented as the visions of Isaiah. Or if you read Nahum chapter 1 or Habakkuk chapter 1, time and time again you will find that these prophetic books are presented as the visions of the prophets. And there are two other Hebrew words that uh, are used in the Old Testament for prophet, Hosea and Roy. And both of them are connected to the idea of seeing clearly. And so the prophets were those who were able to see reality clearly. Sometimes the people of God were going to the temple, they were offering sacrifices, Every, the religious activity was going on apparently well, and the prophets are the ones who are able to see clearly and see their corruption, see their hypocrisy, see their idolatry. And so the prophets or those who, are, who offer the correct vision of the past, of the present, and of the future. And they off, offer this vision to give a shock treatment. They want the people not just to be informed about the future, but to be transformed in the present. Why do the prophets say, look, the Babylonians are coming. Look, judgment is arriving. What's the purpose of giving this information? so that the people will repent and turn back to God. And so they offer the correct vision on reality. So if you want to preach well the Old Testament prophets, make sure you understand the basic characteristics of the uh, prophetic literature. My second suggestion is that you want to make sure that you enjoy explore and even exploit the language of the Old Testament prophets. As we have said, the prophets were masters in their communication. They used metaphors, uh, powerful, hurtful even metaphors, and they used these metaphors to shock the people of God. I mean, when you're compared to a donkey on heat, is that how you said it in English? Or to a whore, when you're compared to a whore, that's not particularly flattering. 
And yet the prophets are, are comparing the people of God to highlight their idolatry. And for us as preachers, we will only benefit from exploiting the treasure chest of communication techniques that we find in the prophets. And when we preach the prophets, we can combine faithful exposition with creative proclamation. Let me give you an example. Let's turn to the book of Amos. Amos chapter 1. And I would just like you to, to know this, the strategy of the prophet. So uh, open your Bible or turn on your Bible to Amos chapter 1. And let's just engage with the strategy of the prophet. You will notice that in verse 2, the prophet introduces the Lord as the one who roars from Zion. And so the Lord is depicted as a lion who is roaring from Zion. And then notice that the prophet Amos starts to deliver oracles of judgment. Uh, can you see that in chapter 1, verse uh, 3? His first oracle is directed towards which nation? Damascus, okay? So if you look to the map, Damascus is, let me change the color. Okay, Damascus is up here, okay? Then the second oracle, uh, verse uh, 6, is delivered to the people of Gaza. So we're down here in the map, okay? The third oracle, verse 9, is delivered to the people of okay, Tyre, which is up here, okay? Then the fourth oracle is delivered to the people of Okay, Edom, which is down here. Then we have verse 13, an oracle for the people of Ammon. So you have the Ammonites, which is here. And then you have the oracle to the people of Moab. Do you notice the technique of the prophet? What is he doing? He is encircling the people of Judah and the people of Israel. Now imagine the response of the people of Israel. Amos, you'll remember Amos, he was a shepherd. He, he wasn't a, a, a prophet by career. And he is sent uh, by the Lord from Judah, from the south. He is sent to the nation of Israel. And as he arrives in Israel, he starts to announce oracles of judgment against Edom, against Moab, against the Ammonites against all of the surrounding nations. What do you think the reaction was of the people of Israel? The reaction was that they were celebrating. They were rejoicing. The Lord is finally going to judge our neighboring nations. And as they're there celebrating and cheering, they're probably thinking we need more preachers like Amos. This is a great preacher who's coming to announce God's action and judgment against all of these nations. But then suddenly, the attention turns to the people of Jude, Judah, which is a bit closer to home. And then after, the longest oracle of judgment is towards the people of Israel. This is what's called an entrapment oracle, where the Lord is portrayed like a lion who is going around his prey. And the people of Israel realize that they are being surrounded and the Lord will act in judgment against them. And if they have been cheering that the Lord will judge the neighboring nations for sins that they themselves are committed, the people have no possible objection when the oracle of judgment is towards them. Now, I would like us to think as preachers, how can we replicate this technique when we're preaching the book of Amos? How can we get our people to identify sinfulness around them and then to realize that actually the finger is pointed to themselves? When I was preaching this part 
of the book of Amos, I started talking about um, sins that are committed by Italian politicians. Now, that's an easy win. Everybody in Italy hates their politicians. We haven't had any Italian government that has lasted its course since the Second World War. So there's a real skepticism towards authority. So the people were glad that I was pointing the finger to politicians. And then I was pointing the finger to society and to aspects that we see in society. And then to our very neighborhood. And then after I was highlighting how as a church, actually, we are culpable of similar sins. And I tried to replicate this, this rhetoric of entrapment. And this is just one example. The prophets use wordplay, they use irony, they're incredibly creative in the way in which they communicate. Let me just give you the main prophetic structures that they use. The most basic one is the messenger speech, thus says the Lord. But then you have unique or, or, or creative manner, ways of communication. For example, you have the lawsuit oracle. You ever notice that in Isaiah chapter 1 or even in Micah chapter 6 where the Lord drags his people to court and then he calls off cre creation itself to be a witness and then you have the prophet who's functioning as a public prosecutor who's highlighting the sinfulness of the people. And you can actually replicate that in your preaching. Cause the people to see that they are guilty and list their sinfulness and replicate not just the content of the passage, but also the form of the passage. Or else you have disputation oracles. Have you noticed these oracles in the book of Malachi? The book of Malachi is structured with six dis disputation oracles. The people say that the Lord, Lord, you haven't loved us. And then the Lord responds and demonstrates his love. The people say that it's futile to serve the Lord. And then the Lord shows them that it's worthwhile serving him. And you have this back and forth. And again, if you're preaching through the book of Malachi, it's a missed opportunity not to use the benefit of this structure. When I preached through the book of Malachi, I had two pulpits. I, on the one hand, I was explaining the objection of the people of God. And then it was very simple. I just moved two meters and was explaining the response of the Lord. And by doing that, you're replicating the content, you're delivering the content, but also replicating the form. You have lament oracles, oracles against the nation, visions, symbolic. And let me just take this opportunity to plug my book. <laughs> um, I have a book which is available down in the bookstore on how to preach the prophets for all their worth. And there's one chapter which is dedicated to considering how these prophetic structures function and consider how we can replicate them today as we preach. I'll give you the details of the book uh, at the end of the session. Third advice, suggestion when you're preaching the prophet, the prophets, make sure you're connecting the prophetic books to Christ. We spoke at the beginning how it's important to connect Christ back to the prophets, but we also want to connect the prophets forward to Christ. And we want to take what I would describe as canonically legitimate roads that connect the Old Testament to Christ. I don't want you to get creative. I don't want you to do exegetical somersaults to get to Christ. There are legitimate roads that we can travel down to get to Christ. And some of these roads that we find in the prophets, we find typology, we find promise fulfillment, we find contrast, Sometimes we realize that we're guilty of the same sins of the people of Israel, and yet we do not, we are not judged, but we are forgiven because of the work of Christ. We have New Testament quotations that help us to link the prophets to Christ, and then we have what is often called biblical trajectory. These themes that start from the book of Genesis reach the book of Revelation from creation to new creation. We have these trajectories that travel through scripture, covenant, marriage, the language of the temple, the two cities, Jerusalem and Babel, Jerusalem and Babylon, the nations, 
And if you think of these trajectories, the prophets contribute significantly to these biblical themes. The prophets talk about marriage. The prophets talk about covenant. The prophets talk about cities, about temple, and about nations. And so if you're preaching on a prophetic passage that is dealing with one of these themes, it's a highway to connect it to Christ. My final suggestion is to make sure you build a bridge to the church. This is John Stott, famous illustration of preaching. And in order to build this bridge, you need to measure the distance. And when it comes to the Old Testament prophetic literature, you need to measure the historical distance, but also what I call the covenantal distance. You have the people of the Old Covenant, and we are the people of the New Covenant. Now, there is discontinuity and continuity, and you need to think through theologically these issues, but make sure that you're measuring the distance so that you can build the bridge. And to build the bridge, do not draw connections, parallels between the prophets and the individuals. We are not Isaiah. We are not Jeremiah. We are not Ezekiel. We are the people of God. We are the covenant people of God who need to hear this message. We are not the heroes in the story. We are often the people of God who are cold and disobedient to the word of God. And certainly do not draw parallels between the nation of Israel and your nation. This is one of the problems, especially with some wings of evangelicalism in the United States, where they claim for themselves as a nation promises that are for Israel. If you want to build the bridge, you need to build the bridge between the Old Testament covenant community and the New Testament covenant community. Theologically, you need to think through the issue of Israel and the church, continuity, discontinuity, but make sure that you do careful theological reflection. And therefore, as a preacher, you want to be a covenant enforcer. You're calling the people of the covenant to be obedient to the covenant. That was the role of the prophets in the Old Testament. And that's our role today when we preach the Old Testament literature.